Friends, I wanted to do this video yesterday. I blogged on this topic yesterday, and so I wanted to do it while like it was fresh and top of mind, and I just didn't have the time to like sit down and compose my thoughts in a video form uh, for, for here on the Clock app. Um, but what I want to talk about, and this would be, so I think anybody, this will be interesting maybe, <laughs> you know, right? Well, not anybody. It's a pretty niche thing. But in terms of like reading Christian scriptures through a Jewish lens is that sort of project. And then also uh, making that digestible and approachable and in a way that I think... Um, you know, people within the lay community could consume this information and maybe find something insightful from it. That's kind of my whole project. That's sort of what I'm up to uh, here and in other places as well. And uh, what I do is uh, on Sundays in particular, to give you like some structure and schedule to it, uh, each Sunday I take the assigned gospel reading for that Sunday that comes from this resource called the uh, Revised Common Lectionary, which is an annual uh, biblical reading cycle used in many Christian communities. And many Christian communities use that um, for their like preparing of the message and what their scripture is going to be about in the weekly service, etc. And yesterday was a reading, and in fact, the past few weeks were are, are from the fourth gospel, which is the gospel according to John. And we call this the fourth, fourth gospel, not merely because it is the one, two, three, fourth in the order, um, but rather its tradition is a little bit different than the first three, Mark and Matthew and Luke. Mark and Matthew and Luke are called the synoptics. They are just seen together. Um, that's what that name essentially means. The synoptic accounts, really similar insofar as Mark came first chronologically written in 70s of the common era, Matthew and Luke after that, um, 90s into the close to 100, maybe even after 100s for, for Luke. Um, Luke Acts was part of a, just one, it was took two scrolls. It wasn't a two-volume set, it just happened, it was so damn long <laughs> that it took two scrolls to write it. Um, but then later, that's just turned into like separate books. Um, there's been some debate about were these supposed to be a, a two-volume account, one than the other. Um, the scholarly consensus that I've read is that no, it just was really long, Luke Acts. It was one big thing uh, that took two scrolls, and so through the years and canonization and selection and yada yada, uh, we come up with two separate books within the uh, Greek scriptures, Luke and Acts. At any rate, uh, Luke is part of the synoptic tradition with Mark and Matthew. And so Matthew and Luke share a lot of what's in Mark and then have some of their own original content that came from an independently circulating source that scholars call Q because uh, the German word for source begins with a Q and uh, the German tradition of biblical source criticism and biblical interpretation is really influential and significant within the modern uh, period. Uh, so there's a lot of terms and stuff that date back to uh, the German tradition of biblical uh, criticism. Uh, maybe you didn't need that history lesson. But what's interesting about the fourth gospel is that it's kind of filled with paradoxes in some ways. And here's what I mean by that, is that there are like mechanics and structural things. Um, uh, I think that's how I want to describe them. There are features of the text that uh, place it firmly within Judaism and shows tremendous knowledge of uh, Judaism, both the rites and rituals and cultic practices of Judaism, but also some like um, topographical, geographical uh, features of Jerusalem and the temple. It seems that that Johannine author, uh, and that text is dated somewhat reliably to 85 to 95 of the Common Era. You you maybe just noted that I said uh, Mark was in 70s of the Common Era. So here we are 20, 30 years later, 85 to 95 of the Common Era is a pretty reliable historical dating for the fourth gospel of the gospel according to John that either emerged from a Johannine community or was written to a Johannine community its own sort of little community. Now there's some ongoing debate about uh, whether that really like was its own formed community. Like the, the Johannine community was like really a thing that really took itself to be like a formal group. Um, and so some people argue on uh, behalf on the side of, yes, there was a Johannine community. Other people argue against that, that maybe there wasn't a Johannine community in the way that we imagine it to be like a structured formed community. Um, and so, and the debate around uh, an epistle and the gospel account and maybe revelation like how does all that is there a johannine theological viewpoint and johannine writings that should all like go together um that's uh maybe more complicated and nuanced than what i want to talk about right now but just to put it in the in the in the air that those debates and questions are 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 open questions um but what we noticed because those like paradoxes i said that there's this like familiarity with Jewish cultic rite and ritual, familiarity with the geography and architecture of Jerusalem, and that like in the story that I'm about to unfold for you, <laughs> that reminded me of the Big Lebowski. Um, the, anyway, if you know that movie, then you'll get that, that reference. Um, at any rate, in the, the story that I'm about to unfold for you, uh, I never seen the uh, Queen and No Damn Dundies either. 
um, that you'll see that there's like reference to this pool of Siloam and there that, that has been excavated, which is interesting that there like is believed to be this actual place. Uh, and there is some connection to the Hebrew text. Uh, Hezekiah made a tunnel in Jerusalem to flow in water and maybe that uh, fed the water that would be in the pool of Siloam. This is a ritual bath um, that um, pilgrims to the temple or just Jews or Judeans who were visiting the temple would have stopped in the ritual bath to make themselves ritually pure to then encounter the, the temple for cultic practices. Um, and so that features in there. So like that, so John clearly like knows some stuff about that Jewish rite and ritual and cultic practice. Um, and the opening verses of John are a genre of Hebrew writing known as Midrash. And so the opening verses of John, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God. Maybe that is familiar to you. That is a Midrash, a Jewish genre of literature that like fills in gaps in the biblical material and expands on the biblical material. So that is Midrash on the creation accounts in uh, Genesis. And so there's some stuff that is like very pro-Jewish uh, within the fourth gospel that shows command and knowledge of uh, Jewish practices and Jewish literature and Jewish, the geography of Jerusalem and stuff like that. Uh, but on the other hand, you also see some of the most anti pharisaic rhetoric. And then I don't want to like use a word that I want to use coded language, right? So, but you know, the Pharisees, what they may be stand-ins for, if that makes sense, a, a tradition that uh, Jesus was this thing. <laughs> but um, there's been a Christian movement against the thing that Jewish was, the, the, or I just said it, that Jesus was. The, anyway, there's anti-Semitism, okay? God damn it, I just said it. <laughs> Anyway, this anti-Pharisaic rhetoric, it like features really significantly within the fourth gospel. And so it's like, well, on the one hand, there's all of this like connection to Jewish rite and ritual and cultic practice and familiarity and even leveraging Jewish writing styles like the genre of Midrash. But on the other hand, there's the most anti-Pharisaic rhetoric or a lot of it that you encounter within the gospel according to John. There's also a lot of high Christology. So it seems like the Johannine community really felt authentically about the full humanity and full divinity of Jesus. Um which you don't get as obvious of that high Christology within the synoptics account, okay? So this is kind of what we're dealing with in the fourth gospel. Now, on uh, on yesterday's reading, if you're in a Christian tradition, you heard this read to you and, and heard it preached uh, in John 9, chapter, uh, verses 1 through 41. There's a blind man who was blind from birth who was given sight by Jesus, and then there's an interaction with the Pharisees, and there's tons to, like, get into here that is really fun to, like, pick apart and to understand. And if, like, you really want to hear, like, my blog, on the topic, you can go to my sub stack and that's, you can go to my profile and you can see how to get there. If you really want to read like my full, um, you know, it'll take you like 15 minutes or so to, to, to read it. So if that sounds interesting, go there. Uh, I'm just going to summarize what I think are the important bits uh, right now. But here's the thing is that there is just such a lack of um, poor, maybe it's training, poor training or, or not enough will for um, Christian clergy members uh, to really be super careful about the lessons that they're reading into and extracting from uh, the biblical material. And uh, in yesterday's account, it just smacks of an anti pharisaic rhetoric that I think is a wrong read on the text. And so let me say why I think it's a wrong read. And I even saw some of my favorite progressive clergy members on this app um, say a few things about it yesterday, and it's just perpetuating this bad read. The, the, the thing is this, that a, a man who is blind, uh, Jesus then gives sight to that person. Then there's the interaction with the Pharisees. And the way that it goes is that what the, what the text seems to be suggesting is that this man who went from disbelief to belief also went from blind to sight. And the Pharisees, although they can see, they are spiritually blind. Um, so that's the the read that Christian clergy members just seem to lean into, <laughs> okay? And it's the wrong read because here's what I think is happening. I think the rhetorician, the narrator, the author of John's gospel here is doing a really fancy rhetorical technique, and it's effective. Uh, they're reaching into the prophetic tradition from Isaiah, and this is in Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. There in Isaiah, God is so angry that he's beyond reconciliation, and God just wants to express anger. Anger. And uh, and what God says to do is to, um, you know, make it so that the Hebrew people's ears can hear, but they don't comprehend and their eyes can see, but they don't understand. And God is just really, really mad at them. And I think that this rhetorical aim in John's gospel is trying to equate the, the target of God's anger in Isaiah with the Pharisees here in this story from John 9. And uh, it's rhetorical, not actual. 